Um, I guess. Um, hi, my name is Dan, uh, and as Sarah said, I'm uh, the director of product development at a little startup in Boston called Wingu. Uh, I've also worked as a sort of an engineer and a team lead uh, uh, at other startups for a couple of years. Uh, and one thing I've done a lot of is to run five whys. Uh, and I really like it. I run something like 40 or 50 in the last four years, I think. Uh, and so I'm going to talk today about how to do that. Um, before I do, um, who here has heard of the five whys? Awesome. Okay. Who here has participated in a five whys? Okay, good. Okay. So what a five whys is, just to be clear, is it's a form of postmortem. Uh, and what's a postmortem? Uh, a postmortem is something you do when your company has badly screwed up. Uh, for an example, uh, at, my, at Wingu, we have a sort of email that we store for our customers in the cloud. Uh, and, and one might say, for example, if your CEO is demoing to uh, an early prospective customer, and they run a search of their data, uh, and they see lots of other customers' data. Uh, as if you can't isolate their data in the cloud, and as if their data is not secure with you. Then you might get some people into a room and say, how did that happen? How do we make sure that never happens again? Uh, that's the kind of postmortem I'm talking about. Not the kind where you've gone all the way out of business. That's a different problem. OK. So the five ways is a way to do this. But there's a problem, which is that the people in the room are humans and not robots. Uh, and humans will kind of mess things up. Uh, and part of the reason is that humans will experience this with a tremendous sense of shame. Uh, and, and shame is a very intense emotion. Uh, and it's going to lead people to have these instincts that are the opposite of everything you're hearing in this room. In fact, what shame is going to tell people very powerfully, it's going like, to whisper in their ear, we should slow down. We should stop making mistakes. We should stop failing. Uh, which is really like terrible. Like That's the worst thing you could possibly do. But it's going to be very tempting uh, in the moment. And, and the first thing I want to tell you, and I really want everyone to believe this, like you're sitting in your seat, and you're thinking, yes. Fail fast, my company will fail, I will not be ashamed, which is that you're wrong. You will have the same response. Uh, and the reason I say this is because I still have this response. I run like 40 of these, I've, I've studied this. Uh, and recently at Wingo, we had a fairly bad outage, and I'm sitting there in the afternoon as you know, irate customers are, are emailing us, and I was like, God damn it, who did this? God, we should slow down. Ah. Um, and and this, this characteristic is actually known in psychology as the fundamental attribution error, the FAE, uh, which is, in, in short, is that human beings dramatically underestimate the power of a situation when they're not in it. You watch other people in a situation, you're like, that person just is weak-willed or whatever. But in fact, like, you're in that situation, you do the same thing. Let me tell you, shame is a very powerful situation, and it will warp your thinking and will warp your team's thinking. All right. So, what I'm going to talk about is you're running a five whys. Uh, you're, that's really what this is sort of guided towards, how to run one of these. And my big idea, the sort of takeaway from this talk, is that what you're doing is you're trying to get your team to get away from that shame-driven mindset uh, and get away from a, uh, uh, what I'm going to say is to, to adopt an economic instead of a moral mindset. Dollar sign for the win. Okay. So what's that mean? All right, well, what that means, I'm going to talk about that with a story, a parable, of two factories. Uh, and they both make widgets. Uh, and they both have you know, monthly widget production goals. And they're both missing those goals by about 10% each month. But they're missing them for different reasons. The first factory, they have a broken machine. You know, it's got a rusty parts, and the belt slips off. And that happens. And they got to put the belt back on. And, but it ruins a bunch of widgets. And that happens every month. And so they're missing by about 10%. So the way that sort of humans respond to the idea of the broken machine is what I'm calling the economic mindset. The kind of questions you might ask are, how much is it costing us? You might say, how much is it going to cost to fix it? Uh, can we kind of partially fix it? What if we sort of tie the, the belt on a little more carefully? So it still falls off, but we reduce the error rate. And are there risks if we don't fix it? Could it get worse? This is the economic mindset. Look at the, the, the words are really key. Cost is a key one. Partial is a key one. Uh, risks, that, that's sort of the mindset. OK. The other factory, same problem. They're missing their production goals by about 10%. But they're missing for a different reason, which is that one of the employees is an ax murderer. <laughs> And about once a month, he goes and kills somebody. And they got to like hire a new person. And they got to train them on the machines. And it takes kind of a while. you know. And so they're missing their production goals by about 10%. Now, if we were to ask the same questions we just asked, uh, they don't seem quite right. And you can't say, well, what if, he, you know, what if he kills fewer people? Are we OK with that? Or it's like some bright person is like, tell you what, we can't stop him from killing people. But if we like train a bunch of temps on all the machines, then we can just like bring new people in as soon as anyone gets killed. And we'll be totally fine. We'll cut it to like 2% of the, the it'll be no problem. So the, the, the key thing is in the moral mindset, which is sort of how we respond uh, to the uh, axe murderer story, those, those questions aren't only, they're, they're sort of, not only is it the sort of answers are wrong, the questions are wrong. 
the questions are actually kind of obscene. People don't feel like they're OK. Um, and the moral mindset instead produces the following thing. This is from Steven Pinker, from whom I feel like I've sort of learned a lot of this. He's fantastic on this. I'm just going to read this because I love it. This is, this is the moral mindset. The search for villains, the elevation of accusers, mobilization of authority to mete out punishment. The other one was like cost, delay, risk, partial. Villains, accusers, authority, punishment. What I'm going to tell you today is most companies, unless they specifically try to avoid it, will treat outages and failures much more like they're looking for an axe murder than they're trying to fix a broken machine. And it's tremendously damaging. So, like the, so the, if you're running a five whys, what you're trying to do is get your team out of that moral mindset so that they can focus on actually solving problems for your business. But it's really hard to do that. Why is it so hard? It's hard because the way that mindsets work for humans, kind of like the sort of framing of stuff, is that no matter what you tell somebody, they'll just fit it into that mindset. So you imagine you have a bunch of people sitting in the room, and there's shame in the air. You know, you showed the search data to the wrong person. Uh, you know, and there's often shame just outside the room in the body of the CEO. You know, that doesn't help. Uh, and they're kind of waiting. Everyone knows that. And everyone's waiting to see who's going to get punished. Probably someone's looking for someone else to accuse. I mean, this is just this is what's happening. And you say, don't worry. We're not looking for anyone to blame. No one will believe you. Like, they'll just hear that immediately and be like, yeah, whatever. Like, it does not change their thinking. It's very hard to change people's framing. And it, like, again, situationally, this is just how it works. People just sit there sorry, kind of closed up with their arms crossed and not listening. So how do you get out of that? You're a person running a five-wise. You have to get them out of that mode to discover ways to solve your problems and go ahead, because you need to do that if you fail. Um, and the answer is actually goes back to the whole human-robot distinction. What do robots not do that humans do? Kind of the stereotypical core thing is actually that they don't have a sense of humor. And this is actually really important. What is humor? Humor is actually breaking of frames. That's what humor is, actually. It's where you have a certain mindset, and you, you, you sort of introduce something just outside of it. And people laugh. They find that funny. Uh, and then after that, they're sort of more willing to shift their mindset. So one of my main takeaways here, the thing I want you to think about is if you're running a five whys, your job is to use humor to break people out of this sort of fear and punishment mindset and then refocus them uh, on economic solutions. And that's really an art. Uh, and I've seen people run five whys who are very good, but they don't do this, and everyone leaves the room tense and closed down, and you don't find good solutions. Uh, I don't think the humor is a sort of a, a nice to have. I think it's sort of necessary. Uh, and everyone I know who's good at these does this. Uh, they don't often sort of analyze and think about why they do. So that's my main takeaway. Uh, I'm going to talk for the rest of the talk a little bit about a couple specific techniques to do this uh, that will sort of illustrate what I'm talking about. So the first one is, um, the, uh, one of the things that happens in the moral mindset is, whatever you've done is the worst thing ever. It's so terrible. Uh, and that's actually like part of the whole the axe murder thing. It's not OK to have like the axe murdering. It's like you can't even compare it. It's so terrible. Uh, so for example, you know, we, we, we showed the wrong search results. We suck so badly. Uh, and the way that I tried to defeat that is I asked. I was like, well, let's situate this on a continuum of bad things, right? This is pretty bad. Did we like permanently lose any customer data? No. I have done that. It is not fun. Um, did did we, you know, did our product misfunction, sort of, you know, misfire in such a way that uh, uh, our main customer uh, uh, had her boss threaten to fire her? Uh, I've done that. That wasn't that fun. Um, did we send uh, hundreds of emails to everybody on one of our customers' mailing list where the emails were just hundreds of question marks? <laughs> and uh, the customer we did that for was a proofreading business. <laughs> Good. That was awesome. So, uh, you know, that's. It's, kind of, it's useful to let people know there's, there's a whole continuum. And it goes all the way through to like, the people who wrote the high-frequency trading thing that lost $400 million. I was like, whoa, I'm going to sleep well tonight. You know, that is, <laughs> I'm never going to do that. OK, so you got to use, so, you know, sort of let people know there's worse things. It sort of frees them. And then they can think on a continuum. This was bad. It sucked that we did this. But you can sort of compare it to other sucky things, which you need to do to do the second part of what Eric talked about in this when he first sort of laid out this idea of the five whys, which is the proportional investment in improving things. Proportional means how bad was it? OK, next thing. Humans have this awesome thing called hindsight bias. Uh, hindsight bias is where, you know, for, uh, here's how it shows up in a five whys. Oh, the problem we had with the question marks was, well, you have to deploy the configs for production, and then the app, you have to do them in the right order. And, like, and the developer will be often like a really careful, conscientious developer will be sitting there saying, I totally knew that, and I just forgot this one time to do the deploy. I, I screwed up. I won't do that again. I'm sorry. And like, here's what you have to do as a person running a five wise when someone says this. You have to totally reject that. Like, that's utterly unacceptable. That's hindsight bias. In hindsight, that was obvious. I knew I shouldn't have done that. I'll never do it again. That's totally false. In the moment, there was like 100 other things you were thinking about. You didn't think of that thing. So the way I do this is I say, well, what, when we say that, when we say, you know, I won't make this mistake again, we're basically saying, here was the problem. 
I was stupid once, and I'll never be stupid again. <laughs> And neither will anyone who runs this business. OK, so the way, actually what I say in all the five whys now is what we're here doing is we're planning for a future where we're all just as stupid as we are today, but we're going to make a system that's resilient to the face of sort of occasional bouts of very intense stupidity, because uh, that's what's going to happen. OK, uh, number three. So this thing is going to happen. You're going to be in your five whys, and it's going to turn out that like the system that you've refactored and everyone's proud of, it's in the cloud. That like the most important customer report is still running off of like a visual cron job on like a Windows server that you never kind of got to the cloud. That's actually in a corner of the office. Someone kicked out the power, and like that's what happened. So you're going to discover that like your system is this weird mess, and your team may feel ashamed of that, and you want to sort of. Uh, Give them license to laugh at that. And one thing I say, and this is actually completely sincere from having talked to a lot of startups, is there's really two kinds of startups. And there are startups that achieve some modest amount of traction on top of a code base uh, of which the engineers are vaguely ashamed. Um, and there's the ones that go out of business. Like, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> so like, <laughs> okay. so, all right. So, so the next thing I want to talk about is the fork in the road. And this actually shifts slightly, but this is actually one of the things I, I most want to get across. Um, so we had a very bad outage uh, a couple months ago, actually, now, at, at Wingu, where uh, our, our product shows up as a shared folder, people's email client. Uh, and we had an early customer. His entire office had, uh, had, had installed this. And then it started their Outlook would start to pop up a little message saying, hey, please log in. And then five minutes later, it would do it again. And then this started happening to their entire office, such that they really couldn't get anything done. Uh, and then we couldn't fix it for three hours. Um, this was not awesome. We had a pretty long five whys about it. And as we got into it, there was two things we found. There's actually a bunch of stuff we found. But the two major ones was one of our developers, very careful conscientious developer, uh, had committed a change to our database access code that made a mistake. Uh, and as a result, we were inserting several hundred thousand rows to our database every like 10 seconds. And it was like that was just causing everything to go haywire. And that was triggering this problem with the, the uh, logins. However, we didn't find out about it for three hours because our system was emailing us errors. That was one of the main ways we found out about errors was through email. And it was emailing us hundreds of times every minute. And our email provider, which is Google, just shut us down and sort of hold what it'll do. And it'll hold all those emails and then gradually deliver them to you. So like for three hours, we're like, what the fuck is going on? Or like we were just running around, like looking at like weird process metrics and like like with this like guru developer who's like looking at like you know LS off or whatever. And eventually, like, and then we got like, and then three hours later, we got an email that's like, here's what's broken, you know. And we could have fixed it immediately if we'd gotten that email. So we're sitting there, we're doing the five whys. We have these two problems. One is that we had a database change that sneaked through our testing and our and our code reviews. And, and two is that our monitoring failed in stress. Which of those is the root cause? Think about that. The answer is actually that we don't care. I don't actually care about root causes. I don't actually call five wise root cause analysis. Uh, one of the lessons of, of complex systems and failure is there's never a single cause. There's always contingencies. There's always things that work together. And that's actually very moral thinking. Like, what was the real reason? Who really screwed up? It's not that useful. What I asked the, the room instead is, sort of, if we made a small investment in fixing things on and sort of column A or column B, what would prevent the broadest class of problems going ahead? If we made it like we made a slightly better system for catching database errors, or we made a slightly better system for improving our monitoring, which of those is going to prevent more issues? Uh, the, mon the monitoring, by, like a huge amount. There's no question. Like the database stuff is a failure. Thank you, whoever said that. <laughs> You're totally right. Um, the uh, <laughs> it's true. The monitoring always wins. That's why. Um, is the um, the database change was very narrow. That just doesn't happen that often. The monitoring was sort of anything that went wrong. We discovered we wouldn't have found out about. So we invested a little bit in the database in sort of database prevention and some review that we do better now. And it, we invested a ton in monitoring, and that's paid off multiple times since. That's a much better conversation to have. Uh, it's much richer, and it kind of opens the door to a better forward-looking thing. Um, so that's most of my talk. Uh, I wanted to sort of uh, uh, remind you, basically, next time something goes wrong, remember, you know, there's probably not an axe murderer. I mean, if there is, I'm sorry, <laughs> and good luck. Uh, but otherwise, uh, I encourage you to go ahead and, uh, and, and, and enjoy pushing your team to think about this stuff economically. Thank you.